For our Bible reading tonight, we turn to Matthew chapter 22, and we begin reading at verse 15. And we will read through verse 22. So Matthew 22, beginning at verse 15. This is the account of how the Pharisees and the Herodians together tried to entrap Jesus with a question about paying taxes. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. It was Wednesday of the Passion Week, so it is the week on which the king will be crucified. It is the day after he has cleansed the temple. Yes, what a ruckus he caused going into the temple because the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations and not a place for buying and selling. So he turned over the tables and drove animals out. One of my friends this past week used this as an argument, as a justification for rioting. He said, notice how Jesus even was involved in the destruction of property, and therefore there's a legitimate protest that involves the destruction of property. My response is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the king. He owns the temple. The temple belongs to him. The animals in it belong. Everything belongs to him. So yes, if he wants to cleanse the temple, he has the authority to do it. But as for you and me, if you and I do not own some property, we better not destroy it. So it is a very controversial context. Jesus has cleansed the temple, and he's been asked, by what authority do you do that? The leaders of the Jews are looking for ways to get Jesus. They want him dead. At the beginning of the week, on Palm Sunday, Jesus had done something that he hadn't done during his ministry. He had initiated a public parade. And it actually called attention to himself as the king and came riding into the holy city on a donkey, a lowly donkey, the colt. Announcing that he was the king, coming into his kingdom. And Pharisees, the religious leaders, are besides themselves. The whole world has gone after Jesus. And now they have just sat in the temple and Jesus is preaching again in the temple. And Jesus loved to preach by telling stories. And he has just told two stories, and in those stories, the religious leaders have discovered that they are in the stories, and they are the bad guys. Jesus told the story of a man who owned a vineyard. He built a vineyard, planted it, and then leased it out to some renters. And then when it was time for the fruit to be harvested, he sent some of his servants to collect some of the grapes. And the tenants instead beat the people, and they kill others. And then finally the man says, well, I'll send my son, and they'll respect my son. And Jesus, of course, is speaking about himself, the king of the Jews. And then what do they do? Well, the tenants take the son, and they say, well, if we kill him, we will be able to have the whole vineyard for ourselves. And so they kill the son. And then Jesus has the owner come and destroy these men who have done that to his son. And the religious 
leaders realize, yes, they are the bad guys in this story. Jesus is predicting what they're going to do. And then Jesus tells another story, and this is the story of a king, and he invites people to come to a wedding. And what happens is that people come up with all kinds of excuses and they don't come to the wedding. And so the king, in his righteous anger, sends armies to, uh, to destroy them. And then he calls people from all the highways and the byways, come to the wedding. And this is all symbolic about how many of the Jews are rejecting Jesus as the great bridegroom of the church. And, and then one guy even shows up at the wedding without proper wedding garments and... Jesus ends the story with this man being thrown into hell. And then Jesus talks about how he is the rejected stone. And the Pharisees understand that Jesus is talking about how they are rejecting him. But Jesus says, yet, yet scripture is going to be fulfilled, that the rejected stone becomes the headstone of the corner. So that's the context. And the Pharisees are determined to bring Jesus down somehow. And so they come up with a question. They want to ask Jesus about God and government, about Caesar and taxes. Now this raises the issue, what is the relationship between the cross and the stars and the stripes? What's the relationship between our citizenship as citizens of the United States of America and then our citizenship in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in which Jesus Christ owns sway? What sort of duties do we owe to our governors and to the federal government? What kind of subjection do we owe to the government? And when does God not require that we obey certain commands of the civil magistrate. The Lord Christ reigns. Isn't that marvelous? We can see all the chaos that goes around us. We have elections. We have political chaos. We have chaos in our cities. Christ reigns. Christ reigns. His kingdom has already come. And he reigns in his grace and in his power. In his power, the Lord Christ is reigning over even wicked people. He reigns over wicked rulers. In his reign of power, he reigns over wicked, reprobate people in all different areas and spheres of life. And then in his reign of grace, he reigns, yes, in the Institute Church. He reigns graciously through his office bearers. He reigns in his reign of grace through godly politicians, godly judges, and godly dads and moms in the home. And isn't it great to know that God's decree of reprobation serves God's great decree of election? In other words, everything that's happening around us in the world is steered and directed for the good of the church of Jesus Christ, for the good of God's people. Well, the Pharisees come and they try to entrap Jesus. The title of my sermon is Attempting to Entrap Jesus with a question about God and government. First of all, we'll look at the meaning of that, and then secondly, the result of them trying to do this, and then the lesson for us. Now, in this context, if you read on, you'll find that there are three different attempts to trip Jesus up with his words. The first attempt is what we have in our text, where we have some Pharisees and Herodians trying to trip up Jesus with a question about taxes. And then from verse 23 and following, the Sadducees show up, the theological liberals, and they try to get Jesus in trouble with a question about the resurrection and about marriage. And then in verses 34 and following, we have a lawyer show up who asks a question about, well, what is the first and the greatest commandment? In all of this, Jesus' opponents are trying to get him to say something wrong. Now, we can identify that with that. We live in a woke culture where what you say or what you say on the Internet or what you write can lead to you getting fired. 
perhaps like no other time in American history. Something you say or a little comment or even liking certain posts on Facebook can lead to people saying, you need to lose your job. Well, that's what the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees are trying to do. They're trying to catch Jesus saying something wrong and then they want to use that to prosecute him, to go after him, and they would love to have a death penalty case. And that is exactly what the Pharisees and the Herodians have in mind with what they are doing with this attempt to trip up Jesus with a question about paying taxes. Now, what strange allies we find in this story here. We find Pharisees and Herodians. Verse 15 says, Then went the Pharisees, and they took counsel. They're trying to plan come up with a question to ask Jesus. In the next verse, we should be surprised to read about the Herodians. We're told, and they sent out unto him their disciples, those, those are Pharisees, with the Herodians. Now, there are some people, or uh, there's one group that's not explicitly mentioned, and that is the Zealots. In Israelite history at this time, the elephant of the room sort of are the zealots. Those are the people who are the serious partisans for independence from the Romans. They're the zealous Jewish patriots. They are the ones who bitterly oppose pay in taxes. They're the ones who are willing to take up the sword if possible. And 40 years from now, the zealots are going to be able to use their influence and their political influence to sideline the Pharisees who are more moderate and they're going to seize power and they're the ones who are going to rebel against the Roman Empire. And that will lead to the chaos that's going to lead to the flames that burn up the city of Jerusalem, terrible destruction, the destruction of the temple in AD 70 when the Romans will, under Titus, pound these zealots and destroy them and that will forever change the history of the Jewish people. Here there aren't any zealots in the picture. Instead we have the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now the Pharisees were in their own way very zealous patriots too. Now when we read the gospel accounts often the Pharisees are the bad guys. They're the legalists. They're the opponents of Jesus. They're the ones who are trying to get Jesus dead. But remember, historically, the Pharisees in the centuries prior to this were in many ways the good guys. They were the people who loved the law of God. After the Babylonian exile, they were the people who loved the Torah. They loved the sacred scriptures. And they didn't, see, they didn't, they didn't want to see God's people falling into idolatry. And so they were zealous to teach the Torah. They were zealous to teach the law of God. And that brought them into conflict too with the Roman government or with Herod the Great at times. That's why at times Herod or the Romans would bitterly persecute the Pharisees. There's stories of Pharisees being crucified in mass at times. And they opposed assimilation with Greek culture. The Romans brought a very dominant Greek culture there. Of course, that had been there already with the Greeks, and Antiochus the Great had tried to push Greek culture. Part of Greek culture were the Olympics, for example, was, was the Olympics. And the Pharisees had stood against that because how did Olympic athletes run? Naked. And the Jews, the Pharisees, said that was inappropriate. And the Pharisees, of course, were looking for the coming of the Messiah, even though when he came, they did not recognize him. And the Pharisees, too, they resented paying taxes. They didn't like that. But at this time, they are the group that is showing cautious resistance to Rome. They're willing to get along with the Roman Empire and with the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, for example. But the Pharisees, you see, were the people who we would say were the conservatives. They, they were the biblical conservatives. And then of all things now... They're in bed. What odd, strange bedfellows this we find here because they're in bed with the Herodians. What an odd political group. Power corrupts. What happened is that Herod the Great had come to power. He had been a client king of the Romans. 
Herod the Great's dad was an Idumean, which means that his dad was an Edomite. But among the Israelites, there were these crazy Jews who actually were supportive of Herod, who is from the line, from the tribe of Edom, being a client king of the Romans. And then some of his sons, two of his sons became tetrarchs after Herod the Great died. One was an ethnarch. Remember how a Herod is going to put John the Baptist to death? One of the sons of King Herod the Great will be there at Jesus' trial. Where there were these Jews who wanted these Herods to remain in political power. So what a strange group. But now they're together, and they hope to entrap Jesus with his words. We're told in verse 15, Then the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And their approach is one of using flattery. Verse 16 records how the Pharisees and the Herodians come together and they say, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Now, that actually is the case. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. And of course, it is true that Jesus is the truth and he teaches what is true and right. But this is all flattery. Flattery is the opposite of gossip. What is gossip? Well, gossip is when you say something behind someone's back that you never would actually say to their face. Well, flattery is when you say something to someone's face, but how great they are that you would never say behind their back. The wise man in Proverbs 29, verse 5 says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were spreading a net, and they're trying to entrap Jesus. And here's their question. They say, tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? It's a question about taxes. Have you paid your quarterly taxes lately? taxes, a perennial issue. They're talking about paying taxes to the hated Roman Empire and the Roman government. They ask, is it lawful? That's the issue. They're saying, is it biblical? Is it in line with the Torah? Is it in line with Exodus and the laws and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, the Old Testament? Is it lawful for us as God's covenant people to pay tax money to the Roman Empire, to Caesar. They mentioned Caesar. Caesar stands for the whole Roman Empire. He, of course, is the king, the functional dictator, although the Caesars, like Caesar Augustus, were trying to push this myth that, you know, they were still following old Roman traditions of government by the Senate. The emperors now had seized power, But the question is, is it lawful, is it biblical to pay tribute to Caesar, to the Roman government or not? The tribute that's being mentioned here is the poll tax. Every Jewish man or woman had to pay a poll tax just for existing. You need to pay this tax money. And for most of the Jews, it was a special badge of the fact that they were enslaved, that they were in servitude to the Roman power. Sometimes they called it a head tax because everybody got taxed. And the rabbis, you see, had disputed about this. Just like the rabbis dispute about, you know, what is the first and great commandment? And then Jesus comes and with his powerful answer to that question. They disputed about this issue. Is it legitimate for us to pay taxes to the empire or not? I mean, they were fine. The, the, the Jews were much more happy with the taxes that were levied at harbors, for example, when it came to goods and the, the movement of goods and taxes, you had to pay for that. That was less galling to them. You had to pay certain taxes, for example, if you'd bring goods through a city gate or at various places on Roman roads. That wasn't as controversial, but this was a more explosive issue. 
In fact, when Jesus was a boy, Josephus, the historian, tells us that there had been a revolt among the Jews about Roman taxation. And that actually spawned the beginning of the zealot movement that would produce the revolt in 40 years. Now, taxes, of course, are very controversial. They're also, taxes are important for developed society. Without taxes, governments cannot function. But they're also a constant point of contention, especially when tax monies are wasted or taxes are so high. And so Jesus' opponents, they think they have got him. They're going to impal him on the horns of, the, of a dilemma. They think there's only two options here, and if Jesus goes either way, they have got him. Now, in one direction, they will have some serious charges to bring against him to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. On the other hand, if Jesus goes the other direction, and if they impal him, if he impels himself on the other horn of the dilemma, then he will lose his standing with freedom-loving Jews. So if Jesus responds to this question and just says, well, it's wrong to pay taxes to Caesar, then they impel him on the horn of insurrection. Now, this would be a grave and serious thing. The Romans were ready to allow client states and subjected people to follow a lot of their own little customs, even have their own methods of ruling sometime. But on one issue, the issue of paying taxes, well, that, that was a very sensitive matter. You needed to pay your taxes, just like also in some churches, for example, in denominations. They'll put up with all kinds of craziness within the, within the denomination, but the moment you stop paying your denominational dues to apostate seminaries, well, then suddenly that is the last, that's the last straw. So if Jesus says, no, it's not lawful, it's not lawful to pay taxes to the Roman government, then Jesus can be tarred and feathered as a rebel. He's just another one of these Jewish rebels that have showed up from time, time to time. Maybe a guy like Barabbas, and Rome cannot tolerate that. Well, then the Herodians and the Pharisees can run to Pontius Pilate and say, this Jesus of Nazareth, this false teacher, has said that people don't need to pay their taxes to the Roman government. And as an insurrectionist, Jesus is liable to be arrested and prosecuted and executed. So that's one horn that Jesus can impel himself on, the horn of insurrection. But then what if Jesus goes the other direction, and instead of saying, well, no, it's wrong, he just says, yes, it's right. Pay your taxes to Caesar, period. Well, then the Pharisees and the Herodians think that they can impel Jesus on the horn of alienation from freedom-loving Jews, or I guess on the horn of being a collaborationist. Now, we are familiar with what happened in World War II in the Netherlands and how there were even Dutch men who were collaborationists. They collaborated with the Nazis. And that was a bad business. And so if Jesus can be pictured as if he is a collaborationist, he's just a stooge of the Roman government. He's a stooge of the hated Roman overlords. Well, then he will lose his standing with anybody who's a zealot or a good, strong patriot. In fact, then he could be charged with treason with respect to the kingdom of God, maybe. And so, the Pharisee and the Herodians wait, which way will he go? And the result is, is an astonishing escape on Jesus' side. In fact, in this chapter, it's very interesting how Jesus avoids the traps of his opponents. With the Sadducees, they ask this, this question about 
this lady who has seven husbands and all the brothers die in order. And so they say, well, uh, you know, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They say if you believe in the resurrection of the dead, you'd have to somehow believe that something crazy, you know, in the, re in, in the future life somehow, you'd have to be able to answer this question about how, who this lady is going to be married to in the life to come. And Jesus just makes the point, well, the saints will be like the angels who don't marry. And, and so the Sadducees are, are put in their place. And then and then later on, another man is put in this place about the first and great commandment. So we're told at the end of this chapter, and no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Well, Jesus, first of all, being the omniscient son of God, understands exactly what they're up to. He avoids being impaled on the horns of the dilemma. He knows the malice of his opponents. Verse 18 says, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me, ye hypocrites? Jesus knows. It's not like they're showing up. And Now, we honestly, we, we honestly want to know the answer to this question. We want to know whether in the right conscience we can pay our taxes or not. Jesus says, No, you're trying to tempt me. And Jesus says, You're hypocrites. You're frauds. We're in a mask. You're fake. You're not asking a question so you can generally understand truth. Everything you say about me being such a, a good person, it's all a mask. It's all a lie. And he says, show me the tribute money. So he says, reach into your pocket or take out your purse and show me the money that you use to pay your taxes. And so someone produced a denarius, a silver denarius. The King James Version refers to it as a penny. This little silver coin was what you got paid for a day's worth of laboring. And if you looked on that little coin, you'd see that it had an image of one of the, one of the Caesars. It was stamped with the emperor's head. If it was a widely used one at that time, it would have had the name and title of the reigning emperor, for example, Tiberius Caesar. Then it would have said, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, Augustus. And then on the other side, if you turned it over, you could see a picture of the Caesar wearing the priestly robes of the Pontifex Maximus the supreme pontiff, because the Caesars liked also to have that great honor of being the supreme pontiff of the Roman religion. Now, for the upright Jew, that very coin, in some sense, was an abomination. Because what did that coin say? Often those coins would make references to Augustus, for example, as the divine Augustus. Now, that's talking about Caesar Augustus. That's the, the emperor who was reigning when Jesus was born. Remember the days of Caesar Augustus. Joseph and Mary went to be taxed. Well, that Caesar Augustus was the man who consolidated power. With him, really, it was the end of the old approach to governments among the Romans, where the Senate really had the place and position of power. Caesar Augustus was the power behind the throne. Even when there'd be different proconsuls, he would be the one who had the final say. Now, his adoptive father, you see, was Julius Caesar. It was Julius Caesar who was perceived to be someone who was violating basically the constitutional rights of the Romans, and he was acting like he was a dictator, and the Romans did not like dictators. They had their own version of a constitutional government. And Julius Caesar, Caesar was viewed as someone who was seizing unrivaled power. And that's why a bunch of senators assassinated him. And then what happened is that all these stories developed and his adoptive son, Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus, spread all these stories about how people saw, for example, Julius Caesar's spirit go up into the heavens and they claimed that he had become God, divinized. Well, if Julius Caesar, you see Caesar Augustus' adoptive father, is divine, then guess what? Guess who he is? Caesar Augustus is a son of God, you see. And so the Roman emperors began to claim 
their version of deity. And so the Jews viewed this as a violation of the second commandment and the first commandment too. Thou shalt not make any graven images. And then on the other side, you find that the Caesars viewed themselves as high priests. For example, Caesar Augustus in AD 17, as the, the chief uh, pontiff had absolved the sins of the Roman people, claiming he had the authority to do that. So someone pulls out that denarius, and Jesus says, whose is this image and superscription? It'd be like if you know, someone took a dollar out of their pocket, out of their billfold or their purse, and he said, whose image is on there? And you'd answer, which American president's face is on the money? And they say, well, Caesar's. And that's when Jesus gave this famous statement that has become proverbial. How do we understand the relationship between our civil magistrates and King Jesus? How do we understand the relationship between the stars and the stripes and the cross symbolic of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus said, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. This has been called the most single most influential political statement ever made. And certainly this statement has been decisive in shaping Western civilization. This statement of Jesus is powerful, it's memorable. It's so striking too because Jesus with this response is evading and avoiding, being impaled on the horns of the dilemma. He says, therefore, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Now, there's a significance to the word therefore here. Jesus says, Render, therefore, unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. The word therefore refers back to that he had asked them, whose is this image in superscription? And their answer is, it's Caesar's. And so Jesus says, therefore, given that that is Caesar's image on that coin, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. In plain English, he's saying, pay your taxes to Caesar." Now, I ran across a commentator who claimed that ancient coins were understood to be the property of whosever picture was on them. Now, I don't know if that's the true or, or not. Then the point would be, well, if, you know, Caesar's picture is on the coin, then fundamentally somehow all the money and all the currency belongs to him, so then you're just paying him back in taxes, money that already, in some sense, is owned by him. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. But, of course, his picture on the coin is symbolic of the fact that this is the official governmental currency of the Roman Empire. And so Jesus doesn't evade the issue. He doesn't avoid the issue. He says, no, render, that is, give back or give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That is, it's proper within the sphere of the state to pay your taxes. That's lawful. Jesus is saying, it is lawful. Now, in the Reformed churches, there have been some cases where members of Reformed churches have said, well, I don't want to pay my taxes because the government is doing some things that are wrong. And some of those cases have led to discipline cases and even excommunication. But that shouldn't have been an issue. Christ here is very clear. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Yes, in the realm of the state, pay your taxes. And if we Americans say, yes, but there are all kinds of corrupt things going on in our government and they're wasting tax money, well, guess what? Do you think in Jesus' day that the Roman government was using their money in ways that at all should have been used? Terrible abuses of power. And yet Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And so Jesus says, pay your taxes that contribute to an orderly society. Good Roman roads, aqueducts, judicial courts. And so we're bound to pay our taxes. Christ has mandated, even though we don't like paying taxes. If you're an independent business owner, you need to pay those, those 
those taxes every few months, it's a rough business. Or when you look at your, at your, uh, your pay slip and you suddenly realize how much tax, how many taxes have been taken out for federal and state taxes, it might surprise you and astonish you. But Jesus says, no, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, implicit in this is that government is a valid institution of God. Marriage is an institution of God. The Church of Jesus Christ is an institution of God. And also government is a legitimate institution of God. God ordains governmental authorities. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, the Apostle Paul famously speaks about government and how we should be subject to it. He also talks about paying taxes as well. He says there, let every soul be subject unto the higher, higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, some people try to claim that this is just talking about just good governments being ordained by God. No, this is talking about even governments like the Roman Empire. The Bible, everywhere we find that governments like the government of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is put in place by God. And of course, God also has the power and authority to remove kings from positions of authority at his whim, according to his sovereign will, as King Nebuchadnezzar experienced when he got lifted up in pride. The state is a valid institution, and therefore Christians can be involved in government. John Calvin, for example, has some very positive things to say about the high calling of being a Christian magistrate. The Apostle Paul says that we may not resist this authority. He says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall, be, shall receive to themselves damnation or condemnation. And therefore, as Christians, we ought to be model citizens. People ought not to read in the paper that, for example, that we haven't paid our taxes. And by God's grace, Christians are model citizens around the world. Why are Christians in prison in China? Is it because they are breaking the criminal code of China? The answer is no. They're being incarcerated for their godliness and their faith. I'm involved in prison ministry. How many member of the reform, members of the Reformed churches or the Presbyterian churches am I finding in my classes in prison? None so far. As Christians, we do show a model subjection to our government. That's why as Christians, we're not into violence. Christians are people who are subject to their government in all things lawful. The Apostle Paul says, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. That's why as Christians, we want to speak respectfully of people who are in positions of power. What responsibilities do we have as citizens of the United States of America. Well, first, there are certain things we must not do. We must not confuse the United States of America with the theocratic nation of Israel. Yes, it's true, some of the early Puritans and founders of our country almost saw America as a city set on a hill, as almost the promised land. Yes, and it is true, many of the first people who immigrated here were Calvinistic Protestants, evangelicals, fleeing persecution in the old world. By the time of the Revolutionary War, of course, there were also unbelievers and skeptics like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, who dared cut up his Bible. At the same time, of course, there was a whole Judeo-Christian heritage shaping the origins of our country. God has blessed our country with amazing freedoms. And thankfully, we live in a constitutional republic. Another thing we mustn't do is confuse the nation of Israel over in Palestine today with the kingdom people. No, the New Testament says that we 
who believe in Jesus Christ. We, New Testament believers, we are a holy nation. We are the people of God. And we certainly have responsibilities as citizens to stand for biblical justice, to seek the welfare of our country and our neighbors, to pray for those in authority over us, to defend our nation against enemies. We have the privilege of voting. We also have a responsibility towards our fellow Americans to tell them about how there is a high king, the Lord Jesus Christ, who must be worshipped and obeyed. And so Jesus says, we are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then he says, and, it's not an or, and to God what is God's. That's how he evades the horns of the dilemma. He doesn't just say, yeah, you're to pay your taxes, period. No, he says, yes, on the one hand, you need to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But on the other hand, you need to render to God what is God's. And this astonished the Pharisees and the Herodians. We're told when they heard these words, they marveled and left and went their way. They realized they hadn't caught Jesus. They hadn't entrapped him with his words. It's not like they could claim, well, he's an insurrectionist. Or they could claim to the freedom-loving Jews that Jesus somehow wasn't supportive of their messianic hopes, for example. And so they're forced to acknowledge Jesus' wisdom. In some sense, with this response, Jesus cuts the Gordian knot on this whole thorny issue of the relationship between the kingdom of Jesus and the state. There's no clash between these things you know, necessarily. He says, on the one hand, you owe allegiance to Caesar, Give honor to your civil rulers. Be subject to them in all things lawful, all things constitutional as well, as we will see. On the other hand, render to God the things that are God's. And when Jesus says this, it's not like he's saying, well, somehow these two authorities are on par with each other. No, clearly, there is one who is far and highly exalted above the other. God is highly exalted above all of the kings of this earth. Caesar even the greatest Caesars who have ever existed, even kings who have reigned over massive domains like Cyrus, the ruler of Persia, who ruled from Egypt to Greece, all the way to India. Even Cyrus, God says, is my servant. No, Christ reigns. The kingdom of God stands. God is king of kings, and we need to render to him what is due to him. And the one who speaks this is the messianic king, of whom it was prophesied that the government would be upon his shoulders. Jesus, who is saying these things, is the messianic king. He is the son of David. David Jesus responded to questions by his opponents by telling them, well, if... The Messiah was going to be the son of David. Why is it that David refers to his son as his Lord? And that stumps his opponents. Jesus is David's son and he is David's king. David's Lord. You and I need to render to Christ what is Christ's. And that is all of your worship and your allegiance. You need to obey Christ above all. You give a limited allegiance to the governor of your state, to the president of your country. But you give full allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has established a kingdom through his ministry, through his suffering, through his dying, through his resurrection from the dead on behalf of the citizens of his kingdom. Christ reigns. He has purchased you through his death. He owns you. You are his citizen soldiers. You are not your own. You belong in life and in death, body and soul, to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is your master. And your master says, you need to love him above family members. You need to love him above all. Jesus even makes really strong statements how you need to hate father or mother. In other words, you need to love him first. Your allegiance to Christ is first. And so Christ puts Caesar in his place. Christ is now ascended into heaven. And if you could have just a little glimpse into heaven and to see the exalted power of Christ and how Christ, with unlimited authority, is sending angels on important missions throughout the world, if you would see and acknowledge that Christ is supreme, how he lifts up kingdoms, he brings them down, he puts Putin as the president in Moscow and is going to soon take him down, he reigns supreme over Mao and then removes Mao from power, puts the president in China on his throne where he reigns now and will take him down soon, you'd be amazed and astonished that your Savior reigns. There is an authority that transcends all human governments. Christ has established his kingdom and he reigns. He reigns in his grace in our lives. Now that he reigns in different spheres, he reigns in your family. Christ reigns in your family through the head of the home. Christ reigns in the church institute through the elders in the congregation. He also reigns in the state through rulers that he puts in place. Now, they're not necessarily in his reign of grace, although his governance of even wicked men is all for the good of his people. And what do we owe towards Christ? Well, we owe him faith. We owe him worship. We owe him obedience. We owe submission to his royal law. We owe to him obedience as tomorrow we get to work. We go about our ordinary job. Christ reigns, and we need to submit to the master. And one does not give God his due if he tries to kill God's beloved son who has come into this world these hypocrites who come with this question trying to entrap Jesus, what are they up to? They're trying to kill the king. By the end of the week, there will be a superscription on Jesus' cross that says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, which is exactly who he is. The authority of the state, though, is limited. The, the, the state has limited authority. Christ, though, has unlimited, unrivaled authority over us. So when Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to, the God, to God the things that are God's, what he's doing is he's relativizing the authority of human governments. Now, even the Old Testament. The kings of Israel couldn't do whatever they wanted. In fact, God had said, their kings were not to have multiple wives. They were not even to have horses and chariots. So God had rules governing what the kings of Israel would do. Even in the Roman Republic, there were all kinds of views about what was legitimate. They had their own version of a constitution. Because back in the day, you see, there had been a tyrant. There had been a Roman king early on in Roman history. And he took advantage of and assaulted a Roman matron. And that was sort of the trigger for the Romans saying, no more kings, no more dictatorship. And they established the Roman Republic and the Senate. And so even governors in the Roman Empire, they couldn't do whatever they wanted. That's why there are local rulers, for example, during the ministry of the Apostle Paul, that suddenly are very concerned and very worried when the Apostle Paul makes the point that here he is a Roman citizen and this local magistrate has thrown him in prison and, or put him in chains or beaten him, and Paul is a Roman citizen, causes all kinds of tension and concern. In the United States, we also have a constitution and a bill of rights. I find that sometimes Christians can be naive. They say, well, if the government tells you to do something, you just got to do it. Now, it's true, as Christians, we are models of submitting to the government in all things lawful. And sometimes the government comes even with things that they don't even have authority to tell us to do. Yet Christians, because it's not a matter of conscience, might go along with it. 
But we live in a constitutional republic, thankfully. We have a Bill of Rights. We do not live in a dictatorship. We do not have a king. When some early presidents like John Adams began to act and conduct himself a little bit like he was royalty, there was opposition from Americans. And when rulers violate the Constitution, they are in the wrong. One example is Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II. When the Japanese attacked, what did he do? He violated the constitutional rights of law-abiding Japanese American citizens and had people on the West Coast from Oregon to Washington State to California round up all of these Japanese Americans and incarcerated them during World War II as a violation of the constitutional rights of these American subjects and citizens. God also doesn't demand of us that we obey rulers who abuse their authority and violate the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Because guess what? Just like the ancient Romans, they were a country who said we're ruled by law. We're also governed by constitutional rights and laws. So the state has limited authority. Now, what are the limits of the authority of the federal government or of our state governments? Well, they, we can resist the state when they step outside of their proper realm. Just go back a few decades and you'll find that Christian homeschoolers in Michigan and in other states faced legal opposition from the states that they were in saying that they might not homeschool their children. In Indiana, the Amish were mistreated by the state government. The state claimed that they had the right to educate the children. The state has no right to improperly legislate in the sphere of the home. The state has no right to come into your home and say, you may not teach your children the Bible. The Chinese government has told the people that they may not take their children to church and teach them God's law. The government has no right to say you may not use the rod of rebuke and discipline if, if you think that's an appropriate thing to do. Also, the state may not encroach on the sphere of the church. See, this is the history of the last century. The state thinking they can do whatever they wish. But the state in communist countries, for example, thinking that they can encroach on the sphere of the home or they can encroach on the sphere of the church. That's why in China we have the three self church which is the government-run church, in which the ministers are told they may not preach on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The state may not do that. The state may not tell the church who it may discipline, who it may or may not excommunicate, what it may or may not teach. No, Christ reigns, you see, in his reign of grace through the elders in the congregation. He reigns in the home through the father and the mother. So the state may not encroach outside of its realm. Also, the state needs to be resisted when they tell us to do something contrary to a clear command of God. If the state comes to you, a policeman says you're to do something wrong or you're working for someone, and they tell you to do something unethical, for us as Christians, it's not difficult, is it? We say we must obey God rather than man, just like the disciples did in Acts 5, verse 29, when the Government officials for the Jews said, you may not preach about Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. You're causing all kinds of trouble. They said, we ought to obey God rather than man. At the Nuremberg trials, Nazis, they said, well, we engaged in war crimes and we were involved in the Holocaust, but we were just following the chain of command. At the Nuremberg trials, there the West said, well, that's no justification for doing what is wrong. How much less should we Christians obey commands to sin or wrong someone? As Christians, too, we have a calling to engage government leaders like the Apostle Paul did. Paul did. Remember, why does Paul end up in Rome? Well, he actually appeals to Caesar. So he uses the whole judicial system in the Roman Empire. So he probably appeared before the young Nero the first time that he ended up in Rome, when he was found innocent, actually. And that was prior to Nero getting as crazy and insane as he was later on in life, which at which time 
Paul had his second incarceration and was executed. And since he was a Roman citizen, according to tradition, his head was cut off. But we can challenge our government, challenge the government for bad laws. For example, these outrageous laws that support partial birth abortion. You see, there's a higher authority than the state. The state is not God. God is God. And therefore, we need to render to God what is God's. Also, as citizens of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that all the problems we face in our society, in our country, are never going to be resolved they never will end until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come. We know it's only going to be with the coming of the king and in making a new world in which righteousness will reign and prevail. That all the problems we see around us will be history. And therefore, as citizens of the kingdom of God, we know the limitations of what are happening when we go to vote. And when we cast our ballot, whether for presidents or governors or senators or representatives or judges, we know that salvation as it is necessary for fallen human beings is not found inside of the ballot box or in the centers of power. Salvation is not found through lower taxes, through universal health care, or better diplomacy. We know that the root problem with us Americans is our alienation from God. The root problem is our rebellion against God, the King of Kings, rebellion against our Creator, and the great solution to this greatest of problems, which as Jesus teaches in his parables, will mean judgment and death and hell for those who rebel against God. The solution is found in Jesus trusting that Jesus of Nazareth is the king, the savior, the soter, the savior. That's a, phrase, a word the Romans used referred to some of their human saviors. Christ is the savior. And so, as Chuck Colson said before, the kingdom of God doesn't arrive on Air Force One. No, the kingdom of God arrives on a donkey as the king humbly comes to pay for the sins of his citizens and establish his kingdom. And the kingdom of God comes on a white war horse as Christ comes again with a sword from his mouth to make all things new again. So it is the message of Christ the king, the resurrected king, which is the message we trumpet. Christ is the one who has our full allegiance. And yet at the same time, we also, as citizens of the kingdom, we render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We do seek the public welfare, don't we? Christians have been famous for that from the earliest times. We seek justice. Yes, not justice as is defined by atheists, but justice as it's defined by the word of God and as it even manifests itself in natural law. We stand for protection of religious freedoms. We can support a functioning economy for the welfare, the physical welfare of our fellow Americans. But we have a limited allegiance to human government because our full allegiance is to Christ the King. So let us render to Caesar what is Caesar's but above all, to God and to King Jesus, what is King Jesus? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that in whatever position you have placed these citizen soldiers, that in this coming week they would be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in your reign of grace, we pray that you'd work in the hearts and lives of these saints so that the people around them would see models of Christian citizenship in our country and models of what it means to be a disciple of the great king. 
We pray that you'd be with our country in this time of turmoil, and we pray that you'd grant peace. You are supreme over our elections, and so we pray that you would place in positions of power people who fear your name and will stand for what is just and right. We pray that you continue to protect the marvelous freedoms that we have in America here. We pray for countries and for Christians in countries where they lack those freedoms, and so they bear a cross. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.